92.1 WROI, WROI FM.com. Streaming audio live, RTC Channel 5, audio and soon to be video on RTC Channel 4. And that's why Brant remains with us. Hey, Brant. How you doing? Welcome back. And of course, 72 degrees and sunshine outside the window on 8th Street. I think, John Alley, it's a great day to go fishing in the Woodlawn Pond. It's what do a you great think? day. We, uh, I don't know how there's any fish left in there. There uh, <laughs> seems to be quite a bit of activity out there this nice weather. It seems like no matter what time of day or night I head out past the hospital that way, there's somebody out Somebody's there Somebody's out there. Yeah. The, the fun part is when you see the you know the dads or the grandparents with exactly. the little kids. Uh, exactly. They're just having a ball. They're, I don't think they catch anything because the, the line doesn't stay in the water long enough. But just to watch them... To, you know, it's the interaction. It doesn't matter whether you catch anything or not, right? Yeah, my, my grandkids, when they come up, that's on their to-do list. I'll bet we got to go too. fishing, so. John Alley's here. He's president and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital, board of trustees at meetings yesterday. Had a uh, July meeting yesterday. Um, again, we're kind of those dog days of health care. Um, not a lot going on. It's kind of slow at the hospital. One of the things we did do, uh, you know, where we've had Dr. Thomay came in as one of our new general surgeons, so we've been kind of discussed with him. He has a very broad background, not only in general surgery, but some other procedures that uh, would be new to our area. So we presented some of the ideas to the board yesterday. Can we look and, and move forward with some of the things he'd like to do? And uh, so we're going to investigate that. Uh, one of the things that you know folks are having to leave the area now is of uh, the laser treatment for varicose veins. And I guess there's you know it's a fairly painful or. Uh, disease if you have that. Okay. So he has got a procedure where he can take a laser and kind of go in and shrink those veins down and you know, take some of that pain away and then uh, once that's done, go back later and actually remove that vein, the vein. So if you got those large, you know, veins are uh, we're we'll probably going to start doing that within the next few months. We're going to have to, you know, get the laser in and some stuff like that. But it's nice to see another procedure that we can offer here. The other one that was, uh, you know, I'd never heard of it before and uh, it was just kind of fascinating hearing him talk about it. It's called the upper GI pill camera. And if you have a, a, a scope done and it doesn't really get into the, the small intestines, okay. this is an, actually a camera that you swallow and then we put a belt on you and it transmits that image to that belt so then the physician can see if you've got a bleed in, wow. in that upper intestine. And uh, he said, you know, it's not a lot of people do that, need it, but sometimes you'll have a GI bleed that can't be seen with the scopes, then this will find it. So. Uh, I think we're going to start doing that procedure. It, it's just kind of that science fiction stuff you, you hear about. and uh, Pretty so exciting, though. It is exciting. And right now, Indianapolis, Fort Wayne, and South Bend is the only areas that are doing that. So we're going to bring that into here. And when we talked to some of our other docs, Dr. Aldrich, who does a, a lot of GI work, he says, oh, my gosh. He said, yeah, there's lots of times we know there's a bleed, but we can't see it with the scope because of, of not being able to get where we need to go. He says, this is perfect for those patients. So be bringing that on board. Excellent. Uh, it's going to be uh, kind of exciting. Uh, he has some uh, background in cosmetic surgery. And so we're looking at some maybe minor liposuction. Okay. Uh, and then the other one is called a cool sculpting machine. And he had to educate me on that. <laughs> and uh, it, it's uh, it's an office procedure, not having to be done in the surgery suite. And if you've kind of got uh, you know that little extra maybe on some around your waist and stuff, basically it takes about an hour. This procedure will kind of freeze uh, the fat cells, and in, in the next two months, they just dissolve and go away, and it, it can sculpt your midsection and stuff. So we're looking at maybe starting that procedure also. Even for guys my age? Well, I, I, <laughs> when I talked to him about it, he just looked at me and smiled. So I, he didn't give me a yes or no. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's some just some new things that we're looking to bring into okay. you know to offer to the community. Uh, I can't do one of those poll, you know, straw polls, just ask some staff members, we're thinking about doing this. And of the 10 people, I said, oh, yeah, we'll do it. You know, and the, you know, the advantage or disadvantage is it's not covered by insurance because it is considered a right. cosmetic procedure. Uh, and, it, you know, it, uh, but it kind of takes some of that excess uh, baggage that we might have developed sure. over time. And, you know, within two to three months, it's gone. So it, it sounds like something we could, uh, some of the folks could benefit. It's not for everybody. Uh, he says, you know, it's a select few, but it is a, a service that we offer that I think South Bend is doing it now and Indy. So, again, it's one of those procedures that don't have to drive. You can stay here at Woodlawn and get that taken care of. I think it indicates Woodlawn is still looking at uh, ways to advance as a hospital and to do things that are important to members of the community. Right. You know, we, as a, we have to evolve as healthcare evolves. Right. And, uh, you know, we were talking about that today. You know, the, the good old days of an inpatient stay in the hospital is gone. Uh, you have to be really, really sick 
to be able to stay in the hospital. So we've got to find other ways now to offset because, you know, years ago we had an average daily census of 30. Then we kind of dropped down into that 12 to 15. Well, now we've been averaging six to nine. It's not just us unique. All hospitals are seeing that decline in that inpatient. So, you know, as we're losing, you know, that revenue, we got to find new revenue sources to help offset offset that. So we're looking at some of this stuff that uh, can help offset that decline in the inpatient revenue. And we've got to redesign how we deliver health care. It is more of an outpatient business now. And, you know, some of us more senior folks who've been in health care for a long time <laughs> can remember, you know, not that many years ago, if you had your appendix out, you were in the hospital for a week. Now you're in there for four hours. We're starting to see now where total joint replacements, which was three, four, five days in the hospital, you're going home the same day with those. So, you know, technology has really advanced, which is to the benefit of the patient. Sure. But as a healthcare provider, we've got to adapt and change our mindset. And we can't think like we used to. We've really got to be more innovative in how we're going to deliver the health care to the community. And a lot of this involves, as we were talking about before we went on the air, with the insurances Correct. and how all of that is going to work out. Yes. It, uh, anymore, we have to jump through quite a few hoops before we can actually get you approved for a procedure. And, you know, a lot of the patients get frustrated. So why is it taking so long? You know, why can't you get me in? Well, we have to wait for the insurance company to actually tell us, yes, you can do that procedure and we'll pay for it. You know, we could probably do it fairly quickly, but I'm guessing most of the patients don't want to sign that and say, yeah, I'll pay for it personally. So, you know, it's, it's education we have to do. It's not, a lot of times we'll go to the patient and say, you know, we're sorry, but your insurance company, you know, we're on day four trying to get them to approve this procedure. They just don't understand what kind of happens in that background that, you know, there's a lot of work we have to do from the point where your physician says you need to have X, Y, Z procedure before you can have it done. It's, it's a fairly extensive review process by the insurance companies. You know, they want to make sure we've tried every other alternative treatment before they'll authorize, uh, you know, the surgery or an inpatient stay. So it's a lot of work, keeps a lot of people busy quite a bit. With all the turmoil right now in Washington, D.C., it's uh, kind of, uh, the insurance thing's kind of up in the air right now. Yeah, I get asked every day, what's happening? And right. the best answer I got is, I have no idea. Um, whatever you hear at 10 o'clock this morning will change by 2 o'clock this afternoon. And, you know, it, it seems like it's just one big argument right now trying to determine what are we going to come up with and what's that plan going to be which is concerning, uh, you know, it shouldn't be that hard of a process, but I guess in healthcare, most of my adult life, I probably have a little better insight than, than those folks in DC. All of a sudden they're just being handed a report that's eight inches thick and says, you need to vote on this this afternoon. Right. So, you know, I, I, I understand a little bit, but again, it's, it's kind of frustrating from our perspective is, you know, how do we plan for the future? Cause we don't know what's going to happen. And, you know, we had the, the Affordable Care Act. We had a lot of folks get insurance on that. Well, now in Indiana, come next year, there'll be no Affordable Care Act providers left. So those folks had insurance for a couple years. Now they're going to be without it again. So we have to change our projections on, you know, what our bad debt's going to be, what our compassionate care is going to be, because now folks are going to be back to that uninsured mode. And we don't know what's going to come out with this, you know, with the president and the Congress. Are they going to put something like that back in place or is it all going to go away? And, and uh, you're hearing that they're going to do away with the Medicaid expansion program, which, would, again, would, our estimate is there's about uh, 400 million people then would be left without insurance right. again. So it's, it's a dynamic problem that we're looking at and there's no simple fix to it. So it's kind of hard to keep track of it. In our discussions before, uh, the Affordable Care Act seems like it's been a good thing for Woodlawn Hospital. It's been a good thing for us. You know, I mean, it had its bad points. And, in, in, uh, you know, if you rank it on a 1 to 10, it was probably a 4 or a 5 as far as being 10 being a, an excellent product. But it did allow those folks who had no insurance before to get some sort of insurance. And from our perspective, you know, we're going to treat you whether you can pay or not. Sure. I mean, that's, that's our mission. That's what we have to do. But when they went to the Affordable Care Act, those folks who before were self-paid and just couldn't pay the bill, at least we got some cash, you know, from this Affordable Care Act and from the insurance to help offset some of the costs we incurred to treat those patients. Okay. So it's, we're hoping something comes from it that, you know, maybe not the same, but we can get those folks back in some sort of program 
to help offset some of the, the high cost of health care. And, you know, I, I work in health care and I, I, I have to pay like everybody else. And I complain. It's very, very expensive anymore with our health care because of the system that we've developed over the past 50, 60 years. We're kind of trapped. I know that you don't have a crystal ball, but do you think somewhere down the line our health care system will go the way of Great Britain or Canada or something along that line? Well, I, I think there's going to be too many lobbyists out there uh, <laughs> that's going to prevent that. And, you know, when, when you look at, you know, uh, United Healthcare, you look at Anthem Blue Cross, they have a very large presence, you know, in Washington dictating how health care is going to be. And it's a billion dollar industry for those folks. If we went to some sort of, you know, universal health, they'd be out of business or they wouldn't get as much money. So I think they're going to influence that. I, I don't think you and I will see anything like Probably that in not. our lifetime. Right. Is it going to go there 30, 40, 50 years from now? Who knows? Yeah, maybe Brandt. So Brandt might. Yeah, 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 he's still a youngster. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's hard telling. I, if I had that crystal ball, I could be a billionaire trying to make some of these predictions. Uh, you kind of just go on, on trends and, and look at history. History is a good predictor of the future. Right. So you kind of look how it was and, and where it's going. I, I think we're always going to have some sort of private payer system. Uh, it's going to evolve. It's going to change. But I think we're always going to have that where you're going to have that choice, multiple providers for insurance that you can choose who you want to pay your premium to. John Alley is our guest, president and CEO of Woodlawn Hospital. Other notes from the board meeting? Just uh, kind of went over the financials for the month. Uh, for the month of June, we had about $10.7 million in our gross revenue. We wrote off 66 which is, you know, that's those contractuals, that's the agreements we have with the insurance companies. Is that a little higher than normal? Is it, it's same? running about the same. We're okay. running right at 62, 63 okay. percent. Our, our goal is next year, we'd like to try to reduce that number by 2 percent. Okay. And that's just going to, you know, be very difficult to do. we got to rene renegotiate some of our contracts. But if we can get a 2 percent reduction in that, that would be a big boon for our, for our uh, organization. So I left us about $4.8 million of revenue that, you know, cash in pocket, so to speak. Uh, we had 4.5 million expenses, so we were able to post about a $300,000 profit for the month of June. You know, July we've seen kind of a fairly substantial uh, decrease in services, you know, with inpatient and outpatient. So I'm, I'm not too optimistic about how the July financials are going to look. And the last three months of the summer. Yeah, that's kind of. I think once school gets back in session, right. we'll start seeing more. We get the kids right. circulating the germs. We'll start seeing <laughs> more folks coming in. And then uh, we do have a vacancy coming up on the board. Uh, Randall uh, Leininger is finally said he's had enough. He can't take any more. Uh, and, we, you know, I'm going to miss him. We, sure. uh, Randall has been a, uh, at times a challenge, which is a good thing. And right. I think we've discussed that before. That's what we need. Those who are in healthcare, we need those folks from the outside to challenge us. We're in it every day. So we get caught up in everything and, you know, maybe not see the forest for the trees. You know, my, the board we have at this hospital, they don't, they're not a yes board. They, they challenge us. They make us verify what we're doing, and I really appreciate that. And we're going to miss Randall. Uh, so we did present, we got a couple names that have uh, shown some interest in being on the board that will permit, uh, present those to the county commissioners. Okay. Ultimately, it's their decision who they put on the board. Uh, Jim Strader and Lance Nelson have both indicated they'd like, uh, you know, a position on that board. So we'll send that to the commissioners and uh, see what they want to do. They could okay. either accept you know, one of these folks, they could have somebody on their own, or they could ask us to submit more names. So, when will they make that decision? Uh, that will be probably in September. Okay, but we we like to get the names to them early, sure. so they got a chance. If they want to interview those folks, you know, bring them in, talk to them. But uh, Randall uh, is going to be stepping down from the board. So, uh, how many years? Oh, 12. It's been quite a 16. few. Sixteen, I think. He'll I have think probably him. sixteen in when he's done. Wow. So. You know, he's been on the board longer than I've been there, and uh, <laughs> he's been a staple. Uh, again, we, he, have we argued? Absolutely. And I think that is a good relationship, sure. that we should be able to have open conversation between the board and administration and not just sit there and whatever I say, they go, yeah, do it. I like the fact that they're my sounding board, and, and I go with them with a lot of things. I'm thinking about do this, like some of these new procedures. You know, they sound good to me, but I want to, you know, somebody who's not in the business, I want to, you know, bounce it off them and get good feedback. And the full board is excellent in, you know, working with administration, work with the hospital. I've, I've got an absolutely excellent board. Uh, so we're, we're hoping that whoever replaces Randall, keep that tradition and we can just keep moving forward and progressing. Excellent. Are there any other notes that pretty well concluded? That was pretty well okay. the board meeting. 
You and I have discussed before about uh, maybe capital projects at Woodlawn Hospital. One of the ones that has popped up from time to time is room renovation. Is that still on the that's agenda? Still, that's still on the agenda. We're, right now, when we get ready to start that, then we have some major changes coming out of Washington. So, you know, we kind of want to see what's going to come from that. Which makes sense. Yeah, we're, we're, we've got kind of a, lack of a term, a sinking fund where we're kind of putting money aside each year back for room renovation. You know, at some point within the next, you know, two to three years, we're going to have to do something. Um, you know, we've kind of put it off as long as we can. But I kind of like to know what I'm dealing with before we make that commitment. And it's going to be a fairly large financial commitment. Uh, the rooms are okay, but they're not meeting our current needs. They were designed, you know, 25, 30 years sure. ago, and they met the needs then. As we've changed how we deliver health care and, and what we put in the rooms with patients now, more monitors, more IV pumps, you know, the, the rooms need some renovation. They need some upkeep to meet our new demands. So we're hoping to, once we kind of figure out what's going to happen with as healthcare payment system moves forward, be able to start that renovation. It's probably going to be at least a three-year project because I can't take all the rooms out at right. once. So we'll have to do maybe two to three rooms, get them done next two to three. So it's going to take a while to work through the building to get all the rooms renovated. But it's still in the works, kind of dusty right now, though. You and I were talking about uh, earlier in the program, length of stay at the hospital. Will that have an effect on how you do the rooms? Yes. You know, I've got to look at uh, is our demand still there for us to have 25 inpatient beds? You know, years ago it was. But if we're continually now seeing on average 7 to 12 patients, then i got 12 empty rooms. Can I use those for something else? So, we, you know, it's going to really take a, a hard strategic look of where we are today, where we going to think we're going to be five, ten years down the road. And maybe I don't make those patient rooms. Maybe I change those into an outpatient setting of some sort because that's where everything is moving to is more of an outpatient basis. So, you know, it's one of those when I get bored watching TV at night, I got an <laughs> office at my house. I go in, I start that's doing diagrams. minutes, isn't Yeah, it? <laughs> I start doing diagrams and, and what ifs and, you know, kind of uh, flow chart. What could happen? And it's kind of fun uh, to trying to predict what that future is going to be. But it, right now, it's pretty uncertain until we kind of get some stability, I think, in what we're going to happen with the insurance and what's going to happen with the health care system that's going to be mandated to us by Congress, sure. how we have to deliver that. So it uh, keeps me keeps me busy, and, and but it's still fun. And, and then, of course, part of that is what do you do if you have a crisis and uh, those rooms are full and you have more people coming in? Right. You know, we have heaven forbid a major disaster right. in the community so you know you, you got to weigh all that together and i've kind of come to the conclusion whatever we decide today will be wrong tomorrow <laughs> uh but you just have to at some point grab the bull by the horse that we live in yes right. <laughs> you just have to make the decision and, and live with the consequences and you know our medical staff i look for them for input too and sure you know traditionally they they've, they're used to having a lot of inpatient rooms if i start saying i want to take some of out of service that you know they get a little uh, nervous at that point but i think uh you know communicate with them get valid input from them and keep them in that process in the loop as we when we get serious about that are we going to take four or five rooms out of service and put another service in there more outpatient instead of inpatient make sure i got their their input in it and uh, keep them involved john alley president and ceo woodlawn hospital any particular agenda items that might come up in the month of august i, I think at that point we're probably going to be starting some of that budget procedure okay. and uh, i was hoping time. we'd have something from dc that we could kind of base the budget on I think we're going to have to kind of get the crystal ball out and, and do a, a best guess of what we think is going to happen. So we'll kind of get some input from the board on the budget, some preliminary numbers, what we're looking at, and <clears throat> set some guidelines what we want to do. Uh, you know, a couple of my things that I, <clears throat> excuse me, I've given to you know the finance folks is two percent reduction in contractuals. What can we do sure. to reduce that by two percent? How can we do it? So you know that uh, there's some things we can do there. I think uh, it's going to take some hard work, but it can be done and uh, just review our expenses again. We, we've done an excellent job on expenses. Uh, critical Access Hospital, our reimbursement from Medicare is based on our expenses. I've never liked that theory because that forces me to spend money that I don't, I don't need to to raise my expenses. So we've actually, over the past three to five years, done an expense reduction program. So if that critical access designation goes away, smooth transition for us to go back to you know a fixed payment system because we've already got the cost out of our system so it, it, you know now it's kind of hard to first get a lot of cost out we're pretty bare bones right now john alley again president and ceo of woodland hospital keep up the good work well, I, 
You are a critical facility for our area, and uh, you are appreciated. Yeah, the, I, my staff makes me look very good. Uh, <laughs> you know, you surround yourself with outstanding people, makes you look good. And we've got some outstanding folks that work at the hospital. I'm very proud of what they do. John Alley, thanks very much. Thank you.